Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. There's a lot going on in the world and much of it has to do with real estate. We're going to take a look at clues in the news. What do the headlines say and what do we think about them? Today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Worldwide demand is making coconuts one of the highest yielding cash crops available today. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and many high net worth individuals have invested billions of dollars into coconuts for strong growth and solid long-term income. Yields could be as high as 18% or more per year. Capital appreciation and exceptional income for up to 60 long years could be an absolutely brilliant investment to pass on to future generations. For more information, qualified accredited investors should email coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. Diversify wisely with direct ownership of fully managed coconuts on prime farmland close to the beautiful Costa Rican border. Email coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. This announcement does not constitute either an offer to sell securities or a solicitation of an offer to purchase. Offering made by prospectus only. For more information, email coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gregg. Hey, Robert. I know you love to read the news. I do. And you stockpile these articles, and there's so much going on, and every few weeks we like to take a look at what's happening, and today we've got a whole bunch of them for you. I feel like I'm an ocean biologist, you know? Your investments are floating in this economic sea that's really swimming with all kinds of activity. There's winds blowing across the surface. There's big, strong undercurrents going on. It's teeming with all kinds of life forms, some friendly, some not so much. And it's a lot to navigate. And so I think that paying attention to the news uh, is important for real estate investors, um, especially because it's easy to get lulled to sleep. People who are trading paper assets like stocks, they watch the news incessantly because they're trying to catch little momentum shifts. And I think this is just an important concept before we even delve into the headlines to understand. In order to make money in any marketplace, you have to find a way to exploit inefficiencies. And so when you're in a uh, perfectly traded exchanges like the electronic exchanges, you know, even an edge of a nanosecond is enough to front run a buy signal. So if you can jump the news and you get inside information, which you're not supposed to be able to trade on, but everybody's trying to get as close to the news source as possible, anticipate the move, whether it's the Fed, something a corporate leader is going to do, some international event or whatever it is, people are trying to figure it out. Well, you know, real estate moves a lot slower and certainly we're affected by the things that go on in the news, but you know, the things that we rely upon, interest rates move fairly slowly, availability of capital and what's going on in capital markets moves pretty slowly, wages and employment, those things move pretty slowly. And the problem is they move so slowly, it's easy to fall asleep at the wheel as a real estate investor. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and a macro trend has come along and it's kind of rolled over a part of your portfolio and you didn't even see it coming. And so paying attention to the news is an important discipline, I think, for any investor, but also real estate investors. All right. So let's take a look at a bunch of headlines today and we won't be able to get into great detail on on uh, anyone. But I think if we do what you do, Russ, and that is you stockpile these articles and then you get kind of a flavor or a feel of where everything's pointing, we'll get uh, some clues here. This first article says, existing home sales slump in June with the weakest summer selling season since 2001. Now, this goes on to quote Lawrence Yoon, who's chief economist for NAR. He's been on the show. Uh, interesting guy, very smart, looks at all the housing information and then spins it in such a way that it looks good for the National Association of Realtors. That's his job. Uh, that's his job. But, but the facts are the facts. And uh, this starts out, in fact, saying, on the heels of home builder optimism tumbling to eight month lows in July, hold that thought because we're going to come back to home builder optimism, what that means goes on to say existing home sales slumped in June down 1.8% more than the 0.9% decline expected to the second lowest level this year. So what does that mean? Existing home sales. We categorize home sales into really two big categories, existing homes, used houses, and new home sales, builders and construction. And even though we might be shopping for a house or a rental house and it doesn't matter to us whether it's new or used, it makes a big difference in the industry because of myriad things including capital costs, labor, all of that to build new and we'll cover uh, some of that in a minute. But the basic picture is that existing home sales are down. So if we stop right there, we could say, oh, well, that's a problem, right? The economy is in trouble because people aren't buying houses. And that may be the conclusion you want to jump to. But it's too early in the show and certainly too early in this article to jump 
to any conclusion because it goes on to say that the medium existing home price for all housing types in June was 263800 Now that's up 6.5% from June of last year. So even though it's down in the last several months, it's up compared to last year, but that's for all housing types. If we look a little closer, it becomes evident that not all housing types or median home price ranges operate equally. And one of the big problems, I know you can't read this chart uh, on the radio no matter how close you look, one of the big issues is that we see prices up on a median basis in homes that are over 250000 homes that are over 500000 homes that are over a million, but it's the sub 100,000 where sales are down the furthest. Yeah, well, there's a lot there. Um, I, you know, obviously it sounds like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, which is a uh, trend that we've been observing for quite some time. And uh, you, you can debate the fairness of it all and what policy should be put in place to correct it if in fact you view it as a problem. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. And Robert Kiyosaki has been telling us for many, many years that this is the way the system is rigged and you have to invest knowing that to be the case. So that part of it's interesting. I think the other thing that's interesting to note, and not everybody's aware of this, I wasn't aware of this until I started hanging out with you, Robert, and that is that new home sales is a very small portion of what really goes on in the home sale market. And the, the lion's share of it is existing homes. But the reason the new home sales get so much attention is because the paper asset pundits, the people you see on mainstream financial television, are often reporting about home builder stocks. Home builders don't get paid for selling existing homes. Home builder profits come from building new homes and selling them. Yep. And so they're important to people who are trying to play the stock market game and play the home builder stocks game. They want to know what does home builder confidence look like? Are they feeling bullish when they look at their crystal balls in their industry? Are they feeling like, hey, there's going to be a lot of buyers. There's going to be economic strength. Therefore, I'm going to go out and build, 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 build. Therefore, generating profits, 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 profits for my shareholders. But when you look at the overall housing market, the number of houses that come on the market new are much smaller than the number of existing home sales. So existing home sales is much more reflective of what's going on on Main Street USA for the average working class person out there. Well, and keep in mind another big distinction, which is this. When we talk about home sales, sometimes we talk about the number of sales, the number of transactions, and sometimes we talk about the price. And together, those things give us a glimpse of the market. In this case, it's interesting that the sub 100,000 is where we've seen the big decrease. But part of it is this. According to Lauren Chun, he says, the demand for buying a home is as strong as it has been since before the Great Recession. Listings in the affordable price range continue to be scooped up rapidly, but the severe housing shortages inflicting many markets are keeping a large segment of would-be buyers on the sidelines. So his point about the reason we don't see the sales volume at the lower prices is because there's not an inventory. And that's existing home inventory. So fewer people are selling houses. Now, guess what? If houses are going up a ton and a house that was 100000 last year is now one twenty five, it's no longer in that category. So that could be it. Or it could be that people are sitting on the sidelines for other reasons. See, there's so much today, we're not going to be able to draw any conclusions immediately. We're just trying to put a lot of it out there so you understand what's being said in the news media. Well, I mean, the other thing you've got is who's your entry level home buyers? It's millennials. Millennials are saddled with student debt. They're getting entry level jobs and in some cases, no jobs at all. And so between their debt and their uh, inadequate income, it's hard for them to buy up in the nicer areas or the more expensive houses. So that's one part of it. The other thing is, is if you're going to go to spend all that time and effort to build a home, why would I go build a new home that is, uh, you know, cheap? I'm going to build a nicer home, especially if that's where the purchasing power is. And so it could be that there's an inventory problem. And of course, as the average home price uh, goes up in value, to your point, Robert, then there's going to be less that are in that lower price range. I think there's another factor coming in too, though, and that is there's a lot of investors who are scooping up the lower end properties. And that makes sense because you have a lot of renters and that's rental class property to a large degree. And for the first time uh, in recent memory, you have a lot of institutional investors participating in that. You know, tens of thousands of homes are owned by hedge funds. That didn't exist 10 years ago. Right. That was really a byproduct coming out of 2008. You know, Warren Buffett comes out and says, hey, if I could, I'd buy 200,000 single family homes right now. Well, people said, okay, well, maybe Warren Buffett can't do that, but uh, maybe we can't buy 200,000, but we can buy five, we can buy 10. 
I don't mean individual houses. I mean five or ten thousand houses. There's there's guys out there that have built those kind of portfolios. We've been to conferences and we've we've seen them talk about the the things that they're looking for. Now, um, some of that's slowing down a little bit, I think, because the a lot of that inventory was coming out of the distress of 2008, and most of that has been scooped up. Not in every area. Some areas take longer for the pig to move through the python, if you will. But certainly in in many areas, a lot of that distressed inventory has already been gobbled up. So you can't do things on scale. So uh, again, it comes back to what we said at the top of the show, there's, there's definitely some indications that there's inefficiencies and opportunities, pockets of opportunities. And the one thing to keep in mind is that whenever we're talking about the news and housing, and we're talking about median and national averages, none of that means squat, uh, really, other than just trying to get which way the big ocean tide, wherever you are swimming in the ocean, that little pocket of sea that you're occupying, that's really what you have to learn to understand what's going on in the markets that you're actively investing in. Right. But to start, we have to start big picture and drill down. And we don't know your market or your markets, the market you're in. You have to go figure that part out. What we want to do is draw attention to some things that are happening on kind of a bigger basis so you can make decisions. It's always compared to what? Is this a good price to pay for this house? Well, that depends on a lot of things compared to what it sold last month or last year compared to what it could rent for. And investors don't think like single family owner occupants necessarily either. Now, in addition to existing homes being down, uh, a couple days later, the startup comes out, says new home sales disappoint as medium price drops year over year. And it says after a disappointing new home sale report, which we just talked about, now there's also disappointment in June. This is, of course, out in the end of July, July 26th. Uh, that uh, house sales and new homes is, are down. Now, they're down by 5,000 sales out of 610,000. So they're not down a ton, but they're down a bit. And of Definitely course, that not has people growth. Concerned. Definitely not growth. And peaking backing on what we talked about before, and that is this quick aside, that home builder confidence also uh, has been affected. So check out this article that came out on July 18th. Home builder stocks hit record high as home builder confidence plunges to eight month lows. Interesting. Interesting that the stocks are up for these home building companies, but every month they assess, the National Association of Home Builders assesses the mood of the market, if you will, by polling the home building community and say, hey guys, good, bad, indifferent, and home builder sentiment, confidence is down. So Robert, if you had to pick one of those two indicators to decide if I could only pick one, which one I'm going to put a little bit more credence on, which one would you go for? Well, for me, rather than uh, look at what the masses are doing, the stock investors, I'm going to look at the front edge of the knife, which is home builders. Yeah. They know what's coming down the pike. They're looking at their existing sales. I don't mean to confuse the terms, but existing new sales, if you will, in their pipeline. But there's also other companies out there. So they're looking at that, but they're also looking ahead to their supply. What do they have in the way of land and materials and building? We're going to get to some of that in, in, in a minute too, because it's also a, a big factor in this. But I think I always want to see what's on the the closest to the bleeding edge. Well, you know, I, I totally agree. And that's why I asked the question, because I think that one of the concerns that we have when we watch the financial news, and we're trying to figure out what is the overall health of the economy, and we're looking at a stock market that's hitting record highs, it's easy to believe that everything's peachy. And we're far from doom and gloom, but the reality is, is when things are not peachy, that's really when there's more opportunity. You just have to be willing to make your moves and know, you know, what and whom you're going to believe. If home builders are feeling like the future isn't as bright as it's been, then that is kind of a leading edge indicator that things are beginning to slow down, at least as far as they're concerned. Hey, before we uh, take a break, here's another article. This came out on Axios. It says the housing market has recovered but construction workers haven't. So this came out in early August and it talks about, it's one of the great mysteries of the U.S. real estate recovery. Home prices nationally are just a touch below pre-crisis levels and at all-time highs in many markets as buyers are scrambling to grab whatever they can during a 30-year low for housing inventory. Okay, pause there for a minute. A 30-year low for housing inventory. That is not just in the sub 100, that's across the board. So there's less homes available. Yet, home builders are moving at a snail's pace to meet this heated demand. They're breaking ground on just 849,000 new single family homes per year, well above the 2007 rate 
of a million. And as we look, and we covered this the, on the show a few months back, that generally we need about a million houses a year to stay current. So this is going to be part of a bigger trend that everybody listening needs to keep their ears on. Yeah, well, you've got, you're always interested in supply and demand fundamentals. And we always break out capacity to pay from demand right. because just because you really want something, demand, uh, doesn't mean that you have the capacity to pay. A or need of, it. I'm, I, I've got to move because of my job or I have more kids on the way. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think technically, you know, classical economists would say that capacity to pay is built into demand. It's part of demand. But I think it's so important, especially in real estate because it's so heavily dependent upon the capital markets, the credit markets, that you, you have to break it out as a separate item. Think about home building. Home building is capital intensive. These guys would be crazy to go out and build a bunch of houses on spec, but you know that's kind of what they have to do. You, you're not, I mean, you might build a fill-in thing or build a suit, but if you're going to go do any volume, you know, you're building houses based on the idea that the market's going to absorb them. And so you need to have financing to pull that off, and you have to be confident that the financing is going to be there for your takeout buyers to buy your finished product uh, to cash you back out again on the back end. Sometimes home builder confidence can give you a little bit of an indication where they see the credit markets forming. You know, Steve Forbes told us when we talked to him at Freedom Fest that one of the big problems in the American economy right now is that banks aren't lending. Yeah. There's there's close to like, what do you say, trillion, $1.6 trillion of, of money, loans that hasn't been made because banks have found it safer to lever up on U.S. government bonds and just park the money with the Fed. Okay, well, you know, that might help the banks be stronger and get them ready to take on whatever downturn may be coming, but it sure doesn't help the U.S. economy because when you, as a builder especially, or any capital of intensive business can't get your hands on working capital because you can't get loans, it's going to slow things down. And it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's part of this. Now, this article talks about construction workers haven't recovered, and this is going to tie together these two thoughts a little bit. It says that in interviews, home builders complained foremost about a shortage of skilled workers. That's why they're not building enough homes to meet demand. In fact, in surveys by the National Association of Home Builders, 78% of construction firms say that labor shortages are their number one concern, up from just 13% in 2011. It's difficult to find reliable labor with the right skills, and that's affecting the end product that comes to the market. Now, on the other side of that is the fact that according to labor advocates, that the real wages of a construction worker haven't changed since 2006, again, when adjusted for inflation. Right. Yeah, I remember uh, doing clues in the news many years ago when the oil thing was huge, right? Everybody, right. and so housing had died, there was nothing being built, houses were selling below replacement costs. So there wasn't a builder alive that was going to go out there and build anything in an environment like that. Blue collar workers needed to find work. And many of them ended up in the oil industry never to come back to construction. Right. And back then we were talking about, hey, down the road, when the market recovers, there's going to be a labor shortage. So, you know, again, it goes back to this thing we said at the top of the show that these are trends that develop very slowly. And so you have plenty of time to paddle into position to ride a wave or to move out of the way of a, uh, of a trend that might wash you in the wrong direction but you know this is something that i think housing shortages we talked about five six seven years ago labor shortages we talked five six seven years ago now i don't know that we expected the oil industry to implode the way it did that was pretty shocking it was one of the things that um i still really haven't found anybody that really saw that coming not exactly 100 percent sure why it happened even to this day but it did and at the end of the day when it did happen we knew or had reason to believe that there would eventually be a labor shortage in construction and sure enough here we are it's important that we stay in touch with what's happening. It's clues in the news today, the headlines, and what they mean to you as a real estate investor. More when we come back, I'm your host, Robert Elms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise 
raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. If you love turnkey cash flowing real estate, then Indianapolis is your market. Forbes just rated it the number one market for renters. As real estate investors, we love renters. Find out if Indianapolis is the right market for you. Get a copy of Aaron Adams' Indianapolis Market Report by sending an email to indy at realestateguysradio.com. That's indy, I-N-D-Y, at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Have fun. You'll learn something. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. Every eight or ten weeks, we like to do clues in the news, what's happening and what it means to you as a real estate investor. So we're perusing headlines and looking at some of the things that are being said. It's not an exhaustive search of all things real estate, but we're painting a picture of uh, what may be on the horizon. Uh, this next article comes from The Wall Street Journal, July 25th. Americans pour record sums into home improvements. Now, there was an article on Newsmax that, that spoke of this article as well, saying that more money is going into home improvements this year as a shortage of new single-family homes across the U.S. pushes up prices and keeps buyers out of the market. So we learned uh, from uh, the previous article that some of that is different in different price ranges, but this is something you and I saw last time around. This was the same kind of article that came out when the markets get heated and before the crash, people thought, well, I can't really afford the new house I want. So instead, I'll remodel. Yeah, you love it or list it, right? You're either going to sell the property that you have or you're going to fix it up and, and, and learn to love it a little bit better. And so it's been a big boon to home improvement companies, home improvement contractors. Uh, they're blaming the current situation, as you just heard, on the idea that there's not enough new home inventory coming out. I'd have to say there's not enough new home inventory coming out that's affordable. Uh, and I think, you know, the decision to stay where you're at and fix up what you've got really is more of an affordability issue. Of course, you know, if the marketplace would absorb the demand, then home builder confidence would be up and they'd be rushing to meet the demand. So you got to kind of put all these things together and ask yourself, okay, well, this article is saying that the home improvement is happening because there's not enough supply. People are willing to spend money to fix up their current home, but they can't find a place to buy. And yet they're willing to spend money. And so you say, well, if the builders were out there recognizing that people are lining up to want to buy properties and there's not enough supply, they would be meeting the supply, but they're not. So to me, the boon in home improvement has a lot more to do with affordability, which could be a factor of wage growth not being what it needs to be. It could be a factor of home prices going up beyond a level, could be a factor of interest rates rising and not being able to lever as much income into as much mortgage. Uh, it could be a combination of all three. Well, often is. We were talking before about the home builders index and part of the reason they're feeling the squeeze is because it's hard to get good labor. But on this side, you know, you've got to pay more for labor. If we have to pay more for labor, that means the house gets delivered at a higher price. People are already priced out of the market that becomes a catch-22. I think it all speaks to prices that are too high. I think it speaks to uh, underlying weakness in demand based on capacity to pay. People are obviously wanting to have a nicer home. They're spending money to make that happen. They just aren't willing or aren't able to spend the kind of money to go buy a new home or to get a bigger home. So, th you know, these are things, again, where you have to be careful. Every time we look at the news, you have to be careful because reporters will assign cause and effect. And you have to say, just because something happened at the same time doesn't mean that one caused the other. Right. You know, you could say, well, it rained today and the stock market went up. Therefore, the rainy weather created the stock market Clearly. spike and it has nothing to do with it. Right. So sometimes it sounds plausible. Obviously, that has no plausibility whatsoever. But sometimes, I mean, these, these conclusions these reporters draw sound plausible and you have to go look at a broader picture to begin to see what's really going on. So just don't assume that because you're reading something a reporter said or something you heard on the radio uh, that, in fact, cause and effect are actually united. You've got to do your own research. You've got to try to figure it out. 
think it through and see what makes sense. And then at some point you have to get to where you trust your own judgment because it is your money and you do have to trust your own judgment. But the information's out there. I think the basic concepts of what goes on in the mind of a home buyer, what goes on in the mind of a home builder, and what's going on at the macro level that affects their decision making. Those are things that average people like us can understand. You don't have to be a bioscience or rocket engineer or whatever, because it's not high tech. It's pretty common sense. We all can relate to it. You know, it's interesting. You talk about the cause and effect part. I mean, this article starts out with Americans are pouring money into home improvements because of a shortage in house. Well, I don't know if you can, again, that's causal. I mean, are they interviewing these people at Home Depot? It's like, how come you're fixing up your house? Oh, I can't find it. I mean, nobody's right. doing that. No, of course not. They're assuming that that's why they're well, doing it. Well, they've got to meet deadline by uh, 4 p.m. Uh, this does say the burst of renovations has been a boon for contractors as well as big home improvement companies. So again, if we were a stock show and we were talking about stocks to watch and we knew that there was an increase in demand for home improvement products, you might go, ooh, time to buy stock at the you know, Home Depot or Lowe's. But you look at the other side of it, which is, hey, more than ever, there are shows out there about flipping houses. There's the guys coming through your town talking about, you know, coming to the seminar, learning how to flip houses. That alone is probably squeaking up the sales at home oh, improvement sure. stores, right? Yeah. In fact, it said this, actually the, the article, both the article Newsmax and Wall Street Journal cite a study from Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies where it says renovation spending is forecast to grow nearly 7% from a year earlier to $316 billion this year. So again, that's also looking ahead because the year isn't over, but based on current trends and so forth, people are spending money. Now, when do people improve their homes? Sometimes when they're getting ready to sell them. Sometimes when they can't buy one, they have to fix the one they have. So we can't draw a cause and effect. We just have to look at the big picture. Well, I mean, one thing I would say is that uh, I still think that the news is pointing more towards softness in terms of long-term price appreciation on property. So if you're in an area that's already pretty long in the tooth in terms of appreciation and you're sitting on some equity, you may say, hey, my cash flow works great. I really like the area. It's got all the great fundamentals. It's great property. I want to stay in. It, but you might think about moving some of that equity out of the property, maybe do a cash out refinance while the loans are still relatively inexpensive and those kind of loans are available because you don't necessarily have to pour that back into another property just yet, although you could. Although you could think about this, if you're out there invested in properties that are in the two, three, four hundred thousand dollar range, and you're sitting on a chunk of equity, and you know that the soft spot is in the sixty, seventy, eighty, a hundred thousand dollar property range, you might be able to move equity out of the more uh, mature property or market into one of these smaller markets and catch a, catch a rise because you know prices don't go from high to higher. I mean, they do sometimes, right. but a lot of times they go from high to low and then back up to high again, and you want to catch them when they're kind of a little bit on the low. Now, obviously, there are some markets and some property types that are just going to keep going down. And we've certainly talked about states that have created hostile environments and are losing population and businesses. I don't know that I'd be investing in places like that. But the flip side of that is adjacent states. I'll just give you an example. Illinois. Illinois is losing more people every month or every year than any other state in the union. Well, right next door is Indiana. And Indiana and Indianapolis have been recipients of some of that as businesses and people have said, hey, I kind of like the general area, but I'm just going to move across this state line yep. and I'm going to get a better situation for myself, more affordable, less taxes, less hostile business environment, more landlord friendly. Uh, and so those are the kind of things you're looking for. Where can I find these, these differences uh, where I can move money from where it's done well but where maybe the prospects for doing well in the future are slower and move it into a more of an emerging growth market. It's clues in the news. What's behind the headlines? More when we come back. Plus, we'll play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. This portion of the Real Estate Guys radio program is brought to you by International Coffee Farms, where you can own a parcel of land in your very own specialty coffee farm in Panama for as little as $15,000. Here's how it works. Deeded half-acre parcels entitled Specialty Coffee Farms in Boquete, Panama are turnkey managed professionally on your behalf by a team of local experts. Sustainable average income is estimated at 12% and cash flow can begin within 12 to 15 months from the date of your parcel ownership. 
International Coffee Farms' mission is to own and operate specialty coffee farms that are economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. As part of this mission, 20% of the gross profits of each farm is committed to a socially sustainable fund to improve the lives of the Panamanian coffee farm workers and their families. International Coffee Farms currently owns and operates nine specialty coffee farms with half-acre parcels available for immediate ownership. To find out how you can become a coffee farm owner in Paquete, Panama, email coffee at realestateguysradio.com. That's coffee at realestateguysradio.com. Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation. And our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid-South Homebuyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A-plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Kim Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Woman, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com and your favorite podcast outlets. It's clues in the news, what's happening around the world of real estate, and we will get around the world. We were focusing mostly on U.S. statistics, home builders, and median price and so forth, but we're going to expand our view here in a minute. But before we do, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia, your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question in a minute you'll hear the question and your job is to come up with the answer and if you do we're going to get you a copy of whatever you are be a good one a great book by lisa congan and the question is right out of the news so there you go before we get to this week's uh, question last week on the real estate guys gene garina was with us and we were talking about uh, demographics specifically senior citizens which prompted us to come up with this trivia question which country has the highest life expectancy well, the answer is Monaco, the second smallest country in the world, boasts the highest life expectancy with citizens living an average of 89.73 years. By the way, number two is Macau at 84.41 years. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Right out of the news, the most expensive home in America just hit the market at an asking price of $350 million. It's in Bel Air, California. It's beautiful but it's also known as being the exterior set of a famous television program. Which one? Which TV show used this $350 million house, at least that's the asking price, for all its exterior shots? Gilligan's Island. No, good guess though. No, is that a good guess? Uh, Green Acres? <laughs> No, it you might be in the right genre, so to speak. <laughs> so if you want to uh, take a guess, please do send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, your guess, which we hope is the correct answer, and your mailing address so we can send you this amazing book of quotes, Whatever You Are, Be a Good One by Lisa Congdon. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's clues in the news, what's going on in the headlines, and what does that mean to you as a real estate investor? Sometimes we read headlines just because we're out perusing the news, and we have to stop and think, now, what does that mean to me as a real estate investor? If home sales are down, for instance, who's buying all these houses? Here's an article that came out in Forbes on July 19th that says, foreign U.S. home sales surged to a record $153 billion, fueled by a substantial increase in sales dollar volume from Canadian buyers Foreign investments in U.S. residential real estate skyrocketed to a new high as transactions grew in each of the top five countries where the buyers originated. This comes out of a study done by NAR, the National Association of Realtors. So a lot of folks in places outside the U.S., this will be our bridge into talking about some of those places, are very interested in U.S. real estate, apparently. Yeah, so uh, obviously there's uh, some geopolitical unrest in the world, and I think most of us are aware of that. It seems like every day we're hearing a news story. So you've got that going on. Uh, you've got people making moves into what they consider to be safe haven assets. And, you know, if you're U.S.-centric, you look at the problems in the U.S. and you're like, oh, my God, why would anybody invest here in the U.S.? But with that said, if you're outside the U.S., you look at the U.S. and say, well, hey, strong history of property rights, uh, very stable form of government, still have the world's reserve currency. Lots of renters. 
lots of renters, uh, strong infrastructure compared to a lot of the rest of the world. So in spite of the things you hear, the United States is still a very attractive place to invest. And when you think about it, of all the things you could invest in, if you've got a stock market that's overheated, maybe real estate is a little bit more real, a little bit more secure. So again, I'm not standing on a street corner interviewing foreign buyers, asking them, gee, why are you buying here? You have to kind of infer uh, on what's going on in the world, why people would want to do that. But you could do that. You know, you have a lot of extra I could. Time. I could totally yeah. do that. But here's the point. The point is, is that this is an impact on demand that is coming from outside the United States. So right. if you say, I'm going to try to gauge uh, affordability of U.S. housing based on the U.S. worker and U.S. wages and lending, and you're going to say, oh, well, I don't understand how home prices continue to go up. Well, it could be that money from outside of the U.S. economic system is coming in, bidding up on those prices. You got $153 billion of demand now coming into the U.S. marketplace. Uh, that puts upward pressure on prices, at least in the markets that these foreign buyers are most active in, which would be uh, another level to drill down into. Now, if you're interested in more about this, it's a uh, profile of international activity in U.S. residential real estate is the name of the report. And it came out uh, from NAR citing activity between April of 2016 and March of 2017. But the reason this is interesting is that this number, the sales number, is up 49% over last year. That's a big jump by any metric. And certainly looking at who's buying, number one, China, that's still the same. But Canada, can Canadian buyers are looking at U.S. real estate. Now, that's interesting because Canadian home prices are headed down. Yeah, so I mean, it's pretty well chronicled in the news, and maybe we should comment on this, that Canadian real estate markets have been crashing. And part of that has been driven by some policy changes they made that hindered foreign investment. And so the demand that was putting upward pressure on Canadian real estate has come out of the market, and so the prices are correcting. And these guys, I think, are wisely, and again, not interviewing any, I'm speculating on what would motivate, but again, what we talked about earlier, hey, I'm sitting on a property that when I do an appraisal and I look in the rear view mirror, I'm in a downward slope, but I can still get a decent appraisal. I can either, you know, maybe sell this thing, but I can certainly refinance it, pull some cash out or whatever, and I can move it someplace where I have a better shot at a long-term future. And they're looking at the U.S. Well, in fact, here's an article from August 6th from Better Dwelling, it says, how far will Canadian real estate prices drop? It goes on to talk about the fact that Canadian real estate is pricey, but how overpriced is the question? And they're seeing a lot of price decreases. And again, if Canadians have investment dollars and they think that the asset closest to them is going down, they look across the border and see that there's markets that are booming in the U.S. Hey, let's just jump over there. Not only that, you add currency conversion to that, and that helps make the decision. Now, the U.S. dollar, we've heard how strong it is and so forth, but in the last six months, not so much. Yeah, this dollar has actually had a pretty rough year. In the last six months, it's had a pretty good downward slope. Again, how does that affect real estate investors? These sound like things that only paper asset or maybe commodity traders are concerned about. But when you look at this much foreign money pouring into real estate, part of the reason is, is because the foreign currency goes further. You know, when the dollar is strong, think about the old days and you know maybe even to a large degree uh, recently but i'm going to go way back when i was a little kid my uncle was a soldier a captain in the vietnam war and so he was over in vietnam with a super super strong dollar and he would send me things he bought me telescopes and he bought me all kinds of things because he could go there and spend money and his dollar went so far right. well when you're on the reverse end of that when foreign currency will go a long way in the u.s it's not surprising that money flows into the u.s to scoop up assets that effectively are on sale based on that currency and this is where you have to get your mind around it you're sitting there looking at life through the u.s dollar lens and you're like, gosh, the prices of houses are going up. That's because you're dealing in dollars which are going down. So it takes more dollars to buy the same house. But if I'm on the other side of the pond and I'm buying in a currency that is going up relative to the dollar, it takes less of my currencies to buy the same house. And I can actually afford to bid the thing up in dollars and still do quite well on the exchange. And so when you're out there as a real estate investor and you are competing for properties and you think you're only competing against that guy across the street or some other investor across town or maybe even out of state, you've got to think more globally and understand what the flow of capital is going around the world 
and how it's coming directly into your marketplace and landing on Main Street and either driving up or down the prices. And then you also have to look like the Canadians experienced is that when too much of the foreign money came in, a protectionist government stepped in and said, hey, you guys are making housing unaffordable for our locals. Therefore, we're going to put the kibosh. Australia's doing the same thing. We're going to put the kibosh on you foreigners buying up and bidding up all this real estate. Yep. And all of a sudden, you've been speculating in the real estate going, oh, it's going up because of all this foreign demand. And the foreign demand goes away. So in addition to the economic part of all this, you want to be paying attention to the political part of all this and how the people who are in charge of the policies, both at the national and the local level, are responding to the pressures they're getting from people that are being priced out of the market for whatever reason and whether they're supporting the people who are benefiting or they're going to be supporting the people who are losing and you just need to make sure that you align yourself not politically but financially with whatever they decide to do whether you agree with it or not yeah good point point. and keep in mind of course that when we talk about real estate investment that is primarily discretionary spending we don't buy a rental house until we can afford to buy a rental house and we do it for a variety of purposes Back to the report on the foreign investment in the U.S., many of those foreigners are buying properties as investment properties. Some are buying a second or third homes. Some are buying just to have a foot in the U.S., right? So there's a lot of different reasons people buy. We buy as real estate investors because there's a return and price is interesting at the time we pay it. What's more interesting, of course, is how it performs based on rental income and demand. So Canada, in fact, this article goes on to say that if they look at this additional regression model they put together, they can build a baseline projection to find out that prices by 2020 will be down 28% in Canada. So if you look at that and you're thinking, well, I was thinking about investing in Canada and you know prices are going to be down 28% or at least if you believe this model, then you might look for another market. Unless, of course, the cash flow during that period of time or the strength of the currency made sense. So it's not just one thing that matters. It's all these things taken together. By the way, as I was uh, researching a little bit on Canada, I found this uh, interesting article that lonely urban centers are Canada's next huge real estate trend. And what they've discovered is that 28.2% of people living in Canada are living by themselves in urban centers. And that's a trend. So trends can be your friend. That could be opportunity. It's too much of a decide. We won't spend any more time on it, but there you go. You know, now, Russ, you mentioned over the pond, and we like to peruse the news around the world. Uh, an interesting article came out from the Daily Mail, which, of course, is a UK publication, on the 12th of August that said, scrap stamp duty for first-time buyers and bring back a 100% mortgage or we'll risk a big city brain drain according to a top real estate boss. So this guy, Paul Smith, is owner and chief executive of the UK's biggest independent uh, real estate uh, firm. And they warned that London is going to see a brain drain of young workers who are going to leave if they can't have affordable housing. So his answer to that isn't to subsidize the rent. His answer is to take away the high stamp duty for these folks and... Give them 100% of the mortgage. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's what's going on in a local market or a, a specific market. But I think the bigger trend is that the companies are faced with this idea that they've got to locate someplace where the housing is affordable because the people have to live someplace. You know, you read these stories about how Google and Facebook workers in Silicon Valley are living in their cars, or even though they're making six-figure salaries, they're basically at the poverty line. You can qualify for housing subsidies in the Bay Area in San Francisco at $138,000 a year of income per household. I mean, think about that. So here's the, here's the idea. We, we've been talking about this forever. Businesses and people will move where they can afford to live and have a decent quality of life. And so this is exactly what we're talking about. Here you've got an environment where businesses are saying, look, if we don't find a way to provide affordable housing for our working people, our working people are going to leave and we won't have any talent, we won't have any business. So either the business is going to have to move to follow the talent, which is like, you know, like my wife and I moved to follow the children and the grandchildren, right. <laughs> right? I mean, people do that because it's part of quality of life. It's a quality of life decision. Our kids moved out of the Bay Area because the Bay Area was too expensive for them. I get it. Businesses are going to do the same thing. And so if, you know, in this particular case, the guy's solution is to change something in the environment politically, and that's a local area issue. And yep. that that's really putting a Band-Aid on the overall problem. And the problem is still the price, but he's saying, let's peel out some of these components 
components of price. You know, the down payment's too much. The, well, he's looking for a solution. The te- yeah, exactly. He's and looking what we're for a talking solution. about is the bigger problem. The bigger problem. But, but the thing is to think about, and we talk about this all the time, think like a CEO. Think about the people who are having to make business decisions about where they can find a labor pool. We talk about picking markets that are affordable, low tax, good infrastructure, high quality of life for the workers and for the the bosses, and then looking at the opportunities to step in educational infrastructure, medical infrastructure. You know, if I have to move someplace maybe, and I'm of that generation where I have to take care of my parents, I can't move them someplace where there's not great medical care. I also can't afford to live someplace that's super expensive while I'm trying to support everybody or I'm being highly taxed or whatever. So again, the, this we're not giving you the answers. We're giving you better questions to ask and the clues about the things that people are thinking about that are creating problems, which the flip side of is an opportunity, are in the news just like this article about what's going on in the UK. It's happening in the United States. It's happening in almost every major developed country. In fact, we'll talk about a related article when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Ranked by Forbes as one of the fastest growing cities, Orlando, Florida has a big and diverse economy, yet still features affordable rental properties that cash flow. Our boots on the ground turnkey provider, Greg Bond at Greater Orlando Homebuyers, can show you how to start generating cash flow today. He just wrote a special report to help you discover the magical market of Orlando. Request your free copy today. Send an email to Orlando at realestateguysradio.com. That's Orlando at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Patrick Donahoe, CEO of Paradigm Life. Wall Street and banks spend billions of dollars per year in advertising with the goal to convince you that they are the solution. But take a look around. None of their advice has worked. If you're listening to this, odds are pretty good that you're already a real estate investor or at least becoming one. So why do you do it? Is it to hedge inflation, the tax benefits, or maybe it's to get your money away from Wall Street? It's because of these benefits and so many more that I created the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy. When you combine successful real estate investing with the Perpetual Wealth Strategy, you have the recipe for what has helped the wealthy to establish their financial well-being for decades. You can download the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy today by clicking the Resources tab on the Real Estate Guys Radio homepage. Don't wait. Go download it now. Hi, this is Anthony Mercury from Hotel Impossible, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. Hey, come on out to the secrets of successful syndication. We'll be in Dallas, Texas in September, teaching folks to go big, doing bigger deals with other people's money, one of our favorite events. You can get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com under the tab that says events. It's clues in the news, what's happening in the news and what that means to you. And we really should have covered this next one before the break, but we had to get to the break. But it's related to exactly what we were talking about beforehand. This came out on Bloomberg August 3rd. It says, the cities where rent hikes leave the most people homeless. Rent hikes are likelier to force Americans into homelessness in housing markets with less slack. So... The article from the UK is one guy's idea of how we can make it more affordable, but there are markets where it's simply not affordable for these people to live. We often talk about uh, the radio station where our uh, show originates from. There's several Starbucks around there, and it's like the people that work at Starbucks in that area can't afford an apartment or a home by themselves. They can't even afford a room. No, they can't even afford a room. So the barista in very expensive areas like you know New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles aren't necessarily in the same category as folks that are working at the same company, say in the Midwest somewhere. Well, this article is talking about a new study where Zillow compared its own estimates for median rent increases in major U.S. cities with homelessness data published by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the markets are maybe surprising, maybe not, but the number one market where there's been a percentage increase in homeless, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Number two, New York, New York. Number three, Minneapolis, followed by Detroit, 
Riverside in Los Angeles. Yeah, and so that can be a factor of the income and the average income and the income prospects in it, the job market. And it can also be a factor of where the rents are and the competition, uh, available inventory, availability of uh, supply expansion. Some areas that you mentioned, highly developed. There's just not a place to put anything. Uh, so, you know, you have to dig into your local area market and figure out what are the dynamics that are driving the outcome. But on the surface, if I'm building a portfolio of of residential rental real estate, I definitely want to make sure I've got a little bit of slack because if the economy is soft, if interest rates rise, especially if I don't have locked in underlying competitive interest rates, if you've got municipalities that are in trouble and they're going to be raising potentially property taxes or uh, special assessments in order to generate more revenue. There's a lot of different things that can put a squeeze on your bottom line. And the idea is just like your tenant, you have to have enough slack between your bottom line and your expenses to absorb higher expenses without necessarily being able to pass on the higher rent. So studies like this can be instructive to you to figure out where uh, things are happening and what might be happening in a particular area that you're invested in. And then you just have to look at your own uh, P&L on your property portfolio and you have to really pay attention to who your demographic is and understand you know, where they work, the jobs, the local economy and ask yourself, does this market have a little bit of slack? Because if it doesn't and you think as you look ahead, like we talked at the top of the show about the home builders looking ahead, if your confidence in the local area economy begins to dip a little bit, do do you want to wait until that's upon you to make your move or do you want to get out while the getting is good and move your equity and money to a marketplace that think you think has a better chance to have a more sustainable cash flow and is going to be the winner in a soft economy? In, in, a, in a good economy, almost every market wins. Very few markets will go down in a good economy. But in a tough economy, there will be winners and losers. And if the losers are going to be the ones that are already maxed to the gills and they require a good economy to stay solvent, if you will, that's probably the wrong word, but to stay viable. And the weaker economies are going to be the recipient of increased demand as people who are in those marginal areas move. Not everybody who gets squeezed is going to end up in the street. They're going to end up in the town next door that's less expensive. And or that's where you want to be. Door. Or the state next door. Exactly. And that's really the point. Those are the macro trends you want to be paying attention to strategically as an investor. Because when you invest in a rental marketplace, you are, you're getting into a long-term relationship. You're not jumping in and out the way day traders do with stocks. You're not flipping properties the way, you know, home flippers or wholesalers are. You're going in, you're signing, a, you know, a 30-year mortgage. You're making a commitment. You're probably going to be in there for five or 10 years at least. So you have to think about the environment that you're investing in and what its prospects are for at least the next five or 10 years. Now, what do stock investors think? Our last article comes from uh, Bloomberg, July 18th. Wealthy investors are leaving hedge funds for real estate. It, the article says that wealthy investors boosted bets on real estate and left hedge funds and equities as concern over high valuations and geopolitical risk pushed them back to basics. In fact, they had 33% of their portfolios on average in real estate at the end of the second quarter, according to this survey by Tiger 21 that was released that Tuesday. And that's a record since the group of high net worth investors started measuring aggregate allocations back in 2007. That's the most money in real estate in 10 years. Well, and that's not surprising. I mean, everything we're hearing, it sounds like the smart money is moving into safe havens. Foreign money is moving into real estate. Uh, you've got uh, these wealthy investors and hedge funds moving into real estate. And, you know, it says back to basics. Well, that's what you do. When, when things are weird, you cling to the essentials. You know, if you look at just the average person's budget and priorities, there's a lot of things that are going to fall off, right? They're, they're not going to buy consumer electronics. They're not going to go to the movies. They're not going to eat out at restaurants. There's a lot of things they're not going to do before they will start cutting into their housing. They're going to pay for food. They're going to pay for housing. They're going to pay for health care. And that health care is a big problem right now. I mean, we keep hearing about how more and more exchanges are going down to one place. So the key is, is to understand that smart money, big money is making a move into real estate. Of course, we've been saying this forever with syndication. This is a huge opportunity. If you're out there as a real estate entrepreneur and you want to take your game to the next level, the real opportunity is to serve these people. They don't want to get their hands 
hands dirty. That's why they're in the paper asset markets. If you can come out to them with a private placement and show them how to put their money into your fund and you go build a portfolio, it doesn't matter. It could be single family homes, apartment buildings, mobile home parks, assisted living facilities, and all kinds of different self storage, all kinds of different things. You can help people move their money into real estate, you know, once you know how to do it because they're looking for it. So coming out of the Secrets of Successful Syndication, you get all the details on our next event on the website at realestateguysradio.com under events. That's clues in the news. Next week on the program, we've got a great show, making the case for entrepreneurship, and we've got an amazing guest, Original Shark, Kevin Harrington will be on the program next week. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life, Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.